Okay, can you hear me? Um, very, very warm welcome to everyone attending this session on data solutions to improve urban mobility. Uh, we have a, a very tight uh, schedule because we have uh, nine speakers uh, in this session. Uh, each of them will deliver a presentation of about seven minutes about their projects or services that uh, are currently undertaking to improve urban mobility based on data. Um, I will not extend because uh, it's really not important. The important are the speakers, the important thing. So um, I will introduce you on the first place, the first speaker, who is Mr. Uh, Gregory Blanc Barnard from the Metropole de Lyon in France. Um, Gregory is the head of digital development service and uh, he has worked in, in Lyon. Uh, he has experience as engineer for 15 years in IT and smart city projects. He has developed the data strategy uh, for the Metropoli and he's involved in several projects crossing innovation, digital and partnership development. Okay, Gregory, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I will present you a project uh, regarding data and mobility. This is the subject of the session. Uh, so first of all, I will just uh, explain you uh, and present you uh, the strategy, the smart strategy of the of the city of uh, of the metropole of Lyon, uh, which is a strategy uh, working on more than 40 projects with uh, hundreds of uh, public and private partners. Uh, spending more than 210 million with the private and public funds. Um, I will not uh, explain all the project today, but if you have questions, I can explain you after that. The important thing is that uh, we have a um, different field for this uh, smart city strategy regarding mobility, energy, digital services, and uh, innovation enabler. And uh, the subject of data is in the innovation enabler and uh, helps all the projects regarding mobility, energy. It, this is kind of, uh, oops, sorry, this is a transversal uh, approach for the data. We have set a platform in, uh, in uh, Lyon. Uh, and the goal of this platform is to allow the local players to innovate and to offer to the citizens new uh, services for the city of tomorrow. And um, we want to help those, uh, those companies to uh, build and create business model that can, uh, that can be developed for the long, long term. So we already have um, a platform that is single point of entry you have to understand that it's not an open data platform only. It's a platform where you can find open data, but not open data, restricted data. You can find geographic data, static data, uh, non-geographic, static, real-time, and etc. Every and public and private data. So um, our goal is to have really a single point of entry for everybody. Everybody wants, everybody wants to create a, a service on the um, on the area of the metropolis. And uh, we want to st share those data with the public and the private sector, with the academic world, with, the, uh, with everyone, in, fi in fact. And we want to do that for a long-lasting uh, period. We do not want only uh, to push data once, but, on to, but to be able to allow the, the distribution of this, those data uh, for a long-lasting period. So we are working on uh, all the legal part with licenses and agreements. Regarding the mobility part, um, we have uh, three axes uh, on the uh, information strategy for mobility. The first one, the first axe is to have an offer for all the, um, all the information that will not be developed by the private sector. So there is, an, um, there is a need and we will provide this, we as a public sector, we will provide this, those information and this is uh, made through a website called Only Move, and the two other axes uh, are uh, to be able to uh, publish data and to allow the companies and other users to reuse those data um, in the spirit of open data, but not only not only this uh, spirit. And the third one is to build partnership with private uh, companies in order to be able to build services. 
And uh, those projects are called OptiMod Lyon and OptiCities, uh, which is OptiCities is a development with the European Commission for a few cities in Europe. So uh, what we have done regarding mobility, we have developed, I, I say we, but uh, this is a private company that has developed um, real-time multimodal journey planner and uh, GPS, multimodal GPS, with uh, one-hour traffic prediction. So there, is, there are a lot of services in this application. Crossing all the way, you can, um, you can uh, move in the, in the city. And we are providing those data in real time on all mode for any time, every, everywhere. And uh, okay, you can, you can read that. And what is important is that we have collected uh, data from many partners. Here you can see all the logos, and, but you have bus transportation, uh, traffic, uh, trains, you have already uh, also, sorry, um, uh, uh, bike sharing system, car carpooling, and uh, etc. I will not explain all of that. We have more than 20 million data a day for only the mobility part, and we also have other uh, information regarding uh, other fields like energy, environment, and etc. But this is focused on the mobility. As a conclusion, uh, digital services need to, uh, to, to be a um, combination, a cooperation between public and private. And the city has a really interesting role in organizing data provision and uh, ensuring that uh, the services provided are respecting the general interest. We are, uh, it's important that we can build new business model independent of the public fundings only. So this is a new kind of uh, approach. And the open data is not the necessary, it's not, in, sorry, it's a necessary condition, but it's not uh, enough, it's not sufficient. We have to um, uh, be able to foster innovation and, uh, and uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have, we have, uh, oh sorry, I can last. Uh, so, open data is not enough and you have to uh, avoid monopolies and um, allow the local players to uh, be enter in the market. Sorry for the, the last part. And then thank you for your attention. Yeah, if you don't mind, since we have so many partners, we will first let them all speak and then please uh, write down your questions and at the end we will have a Q&A session for five to ten minutes. The next speaker is Mr. Rafael Requena from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He's the mobility manager since 2005 and he's a coordinator of the uh, university and mobility group of the Spanish Universities Association, CREU. He previously coordinated a mobility committee at the Sabadell City, uh, uh, close to Barcelona, and worked for a mobility consultancy. So, Rafael, please, uh, it's your time. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, but uh, not from the point of view of the research, uh, but uh, from the point of view of um, managing. Well, I, I'll talk um, about research a little bit uh, at the end, but th this is not the main point. Uh, UAB is a suburban university located like 20 kilometers away from, from Barcelona. You can uh, picture what this uh, can mean in terms of uh, accessibility. Um, to start, I would say that if a uh, smart city is the city that uh, meets people's uh, needs in an efficient, sustainable and integrative point of view, then smart mobility is the one that uh, meets people's needs to access with a more uh, efficient, sustainable and integrative uh, means of transport. Uh, in that sense, what does UAB to achieve smart mobility uh, standards? The <clears throat> answer is in our mobility plan. 
which um, establishes the need and the measures to, uh, for example, um, promote non-motorized transport, more than 2,000 new meters of pavements and more than 3,000 uh, new meters of bike lanes have been built in the last years. On the other hand, promoting uh, public transportation, new uh, bus services and, and train services have been set. Also, uh, increase, try to increase car occupancy, which at the moment is really low. On the other hand, try to electrify um, university fleet, either bicycles or cars. Um, also, make campus accessible to everybody, with the main focus on handicapped people. Foster participation through Mobility Council. And, of course, profit the opportunity, opportunity given by a new technology to approach, to, sorry, to achieve a new approach on uh, mobility management. This means, uh, for example, okay, this, this one obviously affects all the others, as it could uh, be in another way. Uh, some examples of, of what we are working on uh, in that field are, for example, uh, to link surveys with uh, real use uh, data by tracking uh, users, or enable uh, people to see different ways and means to get to the, to the campus in a sustainable way, or also to make possible to know in real time those bus transport uh, service and uh, real time of arrival and uh, make possible to find uh, people to share car and important link this habit to uh, parking policy okay then we are aware uh, this is just the beginning and we have a lot of work ahead but we are convinced this is the way to do. Because uh, planning and managing uh, mobility on a more customized basis is what people are demanding us. So, to end, to finish, the, uh, however this chance uh, technology is giving, is giving us, um, some challenges are, are set. I will refer to two of them. First, just highlight what uh, has been said in, in this Congress or these days, the need to open, open data. Sorry, this, sorry, this is, was the, the last uh, slide. And the need to open data, availability and compatibility are the key issues. Um, and the second, sorry, is uh, finance. Let's forget for a while that what uh, economic problems of universities are facing these days, okay? And let's focus on one of the missions of a uh, university, which is uh, knowledge transfer. In that sense, university is um, supporting research groups, which uh, turn into spin-offs, startups, whatever, which at the same time create uh, really useful solutions for uh, society. Two examples of this are some of the, of the startups that have appeared in the, in the slides. One is, uh, mass, is Mass Factory, the other one is uh, AsLogic, that you can visit them over here, over, over, out there. And um, okay, this is all what I wanted to say to you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, now the, the third speaker will be Josep Maria Deulofeu. Uh, Josep Maria is an engineer and uh, he has a, an engineering and a economics degree and he's the director of the transport division at BSM, the local uh, public company of uh, parking in, in Barcelona. Gracias, Luis.
Buenas tardes. Les voy a presentar un, una solución de Smart uh, Mobility Urbano eh, que denominamos Sistema de Información de Plazas Libres para Autocares en el Entorno de Sagrada Familia, que se implementó en enero de este año en el marco de Zona Bus. Zona Bus es el servicio de gestión e información de zonas de estacionamiento para autocares turísticos en la ciudad de Barcelona. Veamos cuál es la situación en el entorno de Sagrada Familia. El continuo crecimiento del sector turístico en la ciudad provoca un aumento de los autocares turísticos buscando plazas en torno a las zonas turísticas más visitadas de la ciudad. El entorno de Sagrada Familia tiene su propio microentorno de zonas de estacionamiento. En esta zona se dispone de 12 plazas de parada, que son estas que están, no sé si aquí funciona el mouse, sí, no sé si se ve, son estas de color amarillo que tenemos aquí, son lo que denominamos zonas de parada y zonas de estacionamiento, que en concreto son, uh, son 32. Los uh, conductores de autocar dejan el pasaje para visitar el templo en estas zonas de parada, para lo cual tienen 10 minutos, y luego se dirigen a las zonas de estacionamiento. Es precisamente en ese desplazamiento de las zonas de parada a las zonas de estacionamiento donde los autocares iban dando vueltas buscando las plazas libres de aparcamiento. Para resolver este problema pusimos en marcha un proyecto con el objetivo claro de reducir el tránsito de agitación de autocares turísticos en esa zona del entorno de Sagrada Familia. La solución que finalmente implementamos es un sistema pionero de detección de plazas libres de autocares mediante sensores ubicados en las distintas zonas de estacionamiento que lo que hacen es enviar la información de las plazas libres a paneles informativos integrados dentro de MUPIS a la página web del propio servicio de Zona Bus y a smartphones. Veamos el esquema de cómo funciona. En las zonas de, de, de estacionamiento, estas que hemos comentado, hay instalados unos sensores que envían, que leen el estado de ocupación de las zonas de aparcamiento y mandan esa información en tiempo real a los MUPIs, que de hecho son paneles informativos que están en las zonas de parada, a la página web o a los smartphones. Y vamos con un poco más de detalle los distintos elementos del, del, del sistema. Por un lado, están los elementos que sirven para capturar y enviar la información, que son dos, los sensores propiamente y la estación base receptora. Eh, los sensores se colocan en, en calzada y sirven evidentemente para detectar la presencia de, de, de elementos ferromagnéticos como son los ejes de los autocares. Son sensores que tienen una dimensión de 13 centímetros de alto y 7 eh, centímetros de diámetro. La batería que incorporan tiene una vida útil de 5 años y el protocolo de comunicaciones que utilizan estos sensores para comunicarse con la estación eh, base se denomina SIGFOX. El número total de sensores que se instalaron en esta zona fue de 164. La información de estos sensores se envía a la estación base receptora cada vez que los sensores detectan algún tipo de movimiento en la zona de, de estacionamiento. La estación base está basada en un sistema de comunicación de tipo LPWA de largo alcance que utiliza una banda de radio ultra narrow band de 868 MHz que tiene muy bajo consumo. La información recibida por estas estaciones base es enviada a los dispositivos que se utilizan de interface para, para, para transmitir la información a los usuarios como hemos visto, que son los, los paneles informativos eh, web y smartphones. Los paneles informativos están colocados, están ubicados en la zona de, de parada, esta que hemos visto anteriormente. Actualmente tenemos, tenemos cuatro. Y en la zona superior del, del, de los MUPIs está un panel informativo que indica de forma rotativa el, el, el estado de ocupación de las, de las distintas uh, zonas de estacionamiento con tres tipos de estado, eh, completo, libre 
o muy completo, muy lleno. Aparte, eh, el propio MUP incorpora eh, una, una, un, un póster donde, aparte de explicar eh, la información de lo que es Zona Bus y, y, y los servicios que ofrece, eh, ha impreso un código QR que lleva directamente a la información del estado de estacionamiento que ahora seguidamente veremos. Cuando se lee ese código QR o presionando, tecleando directamente en la página web, se accede a esta información. Eh, la información no, no en que, se, que se puede, que se puede eh, conseguir a través o que, que se puede conseguir a través del smartphone eh, no, no se realiza a través de descargar una, una aplicación, sino que está implementada en una web de tipo responsive que se adapta perfectamente al tamaño del, del smartphone. Eh, en, el, en, el, en la propia pantalla se ve, y aquí se ve clarísimamente, pues en distintos colores el estado en que está cada una de las plazas. Además, el, el servicio también indica la ruta más rápida, aquí se puede ver, en esta zona de aquí, en este espacio de aquí, la ruta más rápida para llegar a la so zona de estacionamiento que el conductor ha escogido. Aparte de, de a través del smartphone, la información también... Eh, se puede obtener a través de la propia página web de Zonabus, que es esta que tienen aquí abajo, zonabus.cat. Veamos la valoración que hacemos del sistema. El sistema eh, es fiable y realmente ha dado muy pocas incidencias, costó bastante de ajustar al principio, de calibrarlo al principio, por una vez lo pusimos en marcha, de verdad es que da muy pocos problemas. El sistema además dispone de un sistema de reporting, que facilita todos los datos de ocupación histórico de las zonas, por lo tanto es un valor añadido a la información que suministramos directamente a los conductores. Y a los cinco meses de su puesta en funcionamiento realizamos una encuesta entre los conductores de autocar para preguntarles si conocían el, el, el servicio si lo utilizaban. El resultado fue que un 68% de los conductores conocían el sistema, teniendo en cuenta... Eh, Consideramos que esto es muy alto teniendo en cuenta que muchos son extranjeros y por lo tanto probablemente era la primera vez que lo utilizaban. Cuando le preguntamos sobre el grado de utilización, el 89% nos dicen que lo utilizan y cuando les preguntábamos sobre qué tipo de, de dispositivo es el que utilizan para obtener la información, nos dicen que mayoritariamente a través de los paneles y después a través de smartphone. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you, Jose Maria. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Silvan Rath. He is the founder and CEO of ParkTag, a developer company who works on crowdsourcing technology that auto automatically detects vacant spaces through sensors uh, built in smartphones. In this way, they turn the smartphones into parking sensors that allow drivers to see uh, vacant lots, uh, park parking lots. Uh, before they can arrive. Perfect. Very well explained. So I'm almost done then. So thanks, you, Louis. So my name is Sylvan. I'm Chief Excitement Observer at ParkTech. And uh, what we do is we turn smartphones into parking sensors. So let's see if this works. This doesn't. How can I get to the next slide? Here we go. So what we do with the smartphone sensors, we can detect that a driver is currently in search of a parking spot. We do this completely automatically, so the user does not need to interface with his smartphone whatsoever. I'm going to speak about technology in a second a little bit more. We also know that somebody has arrived somewhere. So we know when somebody has parked their car, again, completely automatically, only based on the smartphone sensors. We can even predict when somebody's about to vacate. So we know that you are walking back to your car and we can filter out whether you're actually vacating or if you're just walking back to the car to leave your, your, your bag in the car. So we can do this based on the smartphone sensors. And then lastly, we also know when somebody has vacated, so when a parking spot became free again. Um, we even have a first prototype of differentiating all the different types of transportation. We can tell whether you are riding a bicycle right now or you're in your own car or you're in a bus 
or in a city train. We can already do that so that we can only, you know, really pinpoint the parking spots that are out there. And this is here where it gets interesting. What we use is all the smartphone sensors that sit on a modern device. So I don't know what you guys know about your own smartphones, but your phone has a barometer on there, so it knows the air pressure. With the air pressure, you can tell where exactly you are down to two stairs of, of, a, of, a, um, of a stair. Um, so we take gy gyroscope, accelerometer, barometer readings, and out of this, with machine learning, we can tell what you are doing around your mobility patterns. So for example, we have those four different signals that I just explained. We would know that you are searching for a parking spot right now. And this data then is collected and can be used for cities, for example, um, to display free parking spots or trend data where it's most likely to find a parking spot. So what we are is a software only, very cheap um, alternative to hardware sensors that you would put into the ground. So we've just heard about hardware sensors and there's certainly an application for those, but in large scale, rolling something out in an entire city is not possible with hardware sensors. So just speaking about the algorithm, what you can see here is actual data readings from the smartphone. So without understanding the algorithm, you can see that the data looks very different depending on what you do. If you ride a bike in the middle on the top, this is how the data would look like of the accelerometer, for example. Um, if you are in a city train, the data looks very different. So with your pure eye, you can see already that there's a vast difference in the data readings depending on what you do. To be fair, we can't even tell whether you're on Facebook or writing an email right now. You can even do that based on the smartphone sensors. So what we have is those on-device algorithms that we offer um, with very small battery drain um, that, that you know, happens through the algorithm running on the phone. There's no personal data that ever leaves the device. So all of the calculations that I'm explaining, they happen on the device. So the only information that leaves the device is a parking spot is going to be free over there in five minutes from now. So what we do is we are a tier three supplier to the automotive and mobility space. So we have this technology and we ship this to anybody who wants to use it for a city, for a mobility app, you know, whatever the application might be. It's a very simple model and we're actually funded by, um, by a public-private partnership called Hightech Gründerfond in Germany. So we're obviously very close to the agenda of what the cities want to, to achieve. Um, and in the end, obviously, the vision is that all drivers see parking from the future, quite literally. They see where a parking spot is going to be free. And before they arrive, they will already be allocated a parking spot. Um, so this optimizes the on-street parking mayhem that currently exists in most urban centers. Just speaking about us a little bit, um, I want to mention that we have received uh, a very large grant from the European Commission. The European Commission has asked us within the Horizon 2020 program, which probably a lot of you know, um, to roll this service out in three model cities across Europe. Um, I can say that Barcelona is one of them, so we're definitely going to try this system over here with help of the European Commission. Um, and the two other cities are currently in selection. Um, we are part of the German Accelerator. Um, we, have, um, we have founded the company in 2014. We're currently 17 people, all engineers, focused on, um, on building the best algorithms there are. And um, we are open for any type of partnership, so I don't know who's in the audience. So if you see application for this technology, then we should definitely have a talk. Thank you very much. Very impressive, Silvan. Uh, Mr. Thomas Hohenaka will be the next uh, speaker. He is the CEO of uh, Clever City Systems. He is both an entrepreneur and a manager, as well as an inventor and creator of new technologies and systems. Since 2010, he has devoted himself to the topic of a smart city and smart apps to offer real data parking solutions and live information for drivers and cities. So, Thomas, please. Plug in my, my own computer. Nice, I'm sorry. Okay. I still rely on Apple. Oi, sorry. <laughs> Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's working. Okay, thank you. 
Actually, I'm going to introduce uh, the theme of parking, but I'm going to give you a little bit the bigger picture, why it's so important uh, what we're doing. Um, and uh, the theme is really data versus luck. Uh, parking is still based very much on luck, unfortunately. That's why we're all making efforts to change this. And why does it cost us billions? Because it has this old medieval system based on luck. In Germany, for instance, we are spending 32 billion every year on gambling. I mean, it's an incredible number. It's, it's equivalent pretty much to our defense uh, budget in Germany. Uh, but these 32 billion don't even include the gamble to find a parking space. So you have to add that money to, to this budget. And finding, looking for a parking space is probably the biggest waste of time worldwide on a daily basis, uh, because about one third of the entire traffic in the city is just looking for a parking space. Uh, so that's really terrible. And if you live in Paris, uh, you spend about three years of your life uh, looking for a parking space. And in Italy, it's two years of your life. So because the, the average time in Europe is about 20 minutes to, to look for a parking space, and that, of course, is, is, a, is a huge problem which we need to solve, and we're all making a big effort to do that. Um, to give you some more numbers, in, in Europe, we currently have about 275 million passenger cars. And for parking these cars, we need about half of Belgium, one third to half of Belgium, depending how you count it, because you need one space at home for your car, you need one space where you're working, and you need another half space or one space where you want to go shopping, you want to go to the movies, you want to go to restaurants. Um, so this, this accounts to about one billion hours in Europe every single year that could be saved if we would have intelligent data. The estimation is that we could reduce, if we would have data where parking spots are, we could reduce the search traffic by, again, by about a third. And, and that, of course, this one billion hours costs us an enormous amount of money. Uh, and the 17 and a half billion kilometers that we drive around uh, are a huge expense. So the European drivers spend 33 billion every single year that they wouldn't have to spend if there would be real data available. Um, and if you add the effects uh, like CO2 emission and you add the effects of nitrogen uh, monoxide emission, uh, this figure actually doubles what it costs us in Europe every year. So about in excess of 60 billion euros because there is no data available. And we, like my colleagues, very much believe that uh, we should offer service rather than punishment in data. Uh, punishment in the long term doesn't work. Uh, we need to make drivers understand if they get good service, they also want to pay. So we are coming again from the hardware side, and we also realize that ground sensors are not the solution, especially because our cities do not want to box in the spaces. Uh, we want to have flexible spaces in the city. We want to encourage small cars to come into the city, not the big hummers. And the problem in ground sensors is that you need to box in the space for the biggest possible car, uh, and that's not the future of our cities. So we developed um, a sensor system that comes from the top. It's extremely precise, and a single sensor in one street uh, can cover up to 100 places. Uh, it's very, very precise. It measures the, uh, the space by 25 centimeters, and it also measures the, the remaining space so in the app, which I'll show you, you also get um, uh, the right size of space for your car. Because it doesn't help you if you have a, a big car and the space is too small. So we give you exactly the size of the space you need. And everything is processed inside the sensor. So no images or no video stream or nothing like that leaves the sensor that could be in conflict with any, any privacy. Um, we are integrating our sensor also into modern street lighting. This has the big advantage that we can also um, dim and manage the street lighting in an intelligent way, which is sort of a side product of, of it, so it's, it's basically for free. And here's an example uh, where we have an installation near Frankfurt. Um, it's one of the busiest uh, spaces in, in Germany, um, with about 5,000 movements every day. And with only four sensors, we cover the, the entire inner city uh, of this place. This is what it looks like. You see that also the sensor captures whether people are parking correctly or incorrectly. They, some park a little bit on the side. And so it measures exactly, is there still enough space uh, for somebody to, to fit in there? 
And we also have an app, obviously, uh, to communicate that to um, uh, the user. We communicate also through local parking guidance systems, but of course also through an app. And the beginning of the app, you, you say which car you have. So we only give you spaces where your car actually fits. Um, so you define, it's very simple, you define the, your destination. We navigate you to the, to the nearest space. You always have a live view of the spaces actually available. And in case the space gets occupied, you automatically reroute it to the next space. And we also came up with a, with a virtual reservation system, which means that if five people, for instance, are going to the same destination and there are only one or two spaces left, we virtually reserve the space for the nearest one approaching, which means that the other four already get rerouted to the next available, eventually in another street, and we tell them how long it will take you to get back walking um, to, to your real destination. So, and then of course you, you, you can pay uh, through, the, um, through the app. It's actually quite amazing, I don't know what you would estimate in Germany, how many people are actually paying for their on-street uh, parking spaces. It's really quite amazing. You would think the Germans are quite, uh, you know, honest, uh, but they're so frustrated from circling around that only between 10 and 20 percent of the people are actually paying uh, for their parking space. So we need to change that to give the city uh, more uh, budget to improve uh, the traffic in general. And we also want to communicate that what it means to be smart to the actual user, and smart means that you have more time for your city, more time for the beautiful things in your city, rather than wasting your time circling around for nothing. So thanks very much. So I'm going to plug this. Thank you. So may I call now may I call now Francisca Mailanda. She is the marketing and PR communication manager of the HiQ Computer Lusungen company. It's a German company uh, who is offering uh, solutions on interoperable and intermodal mobile ticketing for public transport authorities and smarter cities. So hello, everybody. Um, now we have focused um, very much on the individual traffic and I'd like to set the focus right now on the public transport. And um, I just want to ask, can a simple smartphone app have a positive effect on the environment? And I'd like to outline to you the benefits for public transport providers and end users using smartphone apps. Therefore, I'd like to introduce to you our smartphone app called MyTrack. It's a multimodal mobility assistant and it's smart, it's interoperable and it's intermodal. Smart means MyTrack is connected to an open background system architecture. Intermodal means it integrates public transport services and different car sharing services with other sustainable means of mobility like bike rentals or e-scooters. And interoperable means MyTrack is based on an interoperable e-ticket standard this is the e-ticket Deutschland standard. Due to the standard, it is unimportant where you buy your ticket. It's just um, either you buy it in Berlin or you buy it in Munich. You, the idea is to get, you get the uh, invoice at the end of the month and you pay um, monthly your bills. Like uh, we do it when we have our um, phone providers, we also get uh, it by roaming. But the app actually is an app for routing and ticketing, but it's still more. Um, 
my track is quite complex and I'd like to give you some examples how public transport providers are able to implement my track in their daily business. My track doesn't just sell tickets, it's also able to get them controlled, to get them inspected. Using the app for ticket inspections, inspectors do not need uh, any h hardware anymore, they just need a smartphone, a simple smartphone. They control it um, with a smartphone with near field communication. And another positive aspect for the transport providers is that if they are subsidi subsidizing um, the um, taxis for the last mile, they can now control the bills they get from the taxi companies because you can check in as a passenger with your e-card on the smartphone of the taxi driver and you can check out and so it is very transparent for both for the passengers as well as for the taxi companies <laughs> as well as for um, the transport providers. My track can also um, flexibly adapt new products. Like for example, it can um, have combination tickets for going to the museum or going to the theater or to the aquarium. You just have one ticket, you can buy it on your smartphone. We have also different means of payment and uh, right now we have realized digit cash and flashes, but um, we're still planning on doing some more integ integration. Well, and the um, benefits for end users are quite obvious. First of all, getting people from one place to another in the shortest possible time without traffic jams without long searching for a parking slot. And you can choose options, whether you want to go fast, whether you want to take the, a sustainable route, or if, it's, if you want to go less pricey. You can choose an option, and afterwards you can get your ticket for all the intermodal traffic, means of traffic or, or, or of transportation. My track is so simple to use it gives easy access to sustainable mobility. This is especially important for people who use public transportation systems less frequently, or for people who travel in cities they're not familiar with, where they're neither used to the payment requirements nor know exactly where to go. So you might ask, where do we find my track? You'll find it in the Google Play Store and uh, soon you'll find it on the Apple App Store. And we have a well-known, highly awarded variant of my track. This is the M-Ticket in Lux Luxembourg. And uh, it was uh, developed for the transport authorities there. The M-Ticket was awarded twice this year in Dubai and Berlin. What I haven't mentioned yet are the benefits for all of us using smartphone apps for public transportation purposes. Making traveling easier also means getting more people using and paying for public transport systems. With more money flowing, public transport systems can again be more efficient. This also means less individual traffic, less traffic jams, less pollution, and therefore it has a positive effect on our environment. Thank you. Okay. Now, now is the turn of uh, Maria Isabel Flores. Um, Maria Isabel is the business development manager of a company called Ali from Germany. Uh, she's a cybernetist and museologist. Uh, you have to explain us <laughs> this. 
with a passion for public transport as a way of living and experiencing the cities. Um, Ali is challenging the status quo of private mobility uh, in order to give voice to commuters' needs and make cities smarter through data solutions. So, Maria. Thank you. First, thank you for bollocks. <laughs> yeah. Creo que así mejor. Okay. So, um, um, thank you for sticking up. Uh, thank you for, for staying so long. Okay, let's try to see this. Uh, thank you, Francisca, for opening, you know, from paving the way to, yes, indeed, let's, let's pass to something kind of like very, very interesting, which is public transportation. Okay, so I would like to, to start with these kind of like bold statements that apparently are gonna like grasp you. Uh, so, um, mobility is a human necessity, but I would like to say that mobility is a human right. Got you. Okay, so uh, we are facing, you know, these big challenges of the urban sprawl. Right now, we don't have to wait until 2020 or 2050. We are facing them right now. And in Ali, we want to tackle the challenge of mobility and transportation by turning the tables. You know, instead of uh, perpetuating this old-fashioned model of supply and demand, we want to, to turn it into kind of like a demand based, based on the needs of our commuters. So for this, as you can see, data is at the core of our, or of our vision. By sourcing, sourcing it, by analyzing it, is how we can start building and providing solutions. Our, come on, how? S? There you go. Okay, so our, our uh, organic process starts with sourcing the data from different origins and crowdsourcing it when the data is not existent. From there, uh, we can actually develop an app. And we can start, uh, through the use of the app, we can start producing data, producing inf information, and producing knowledge uh, through which um, we can start providing uh, also useful solutions. And we can start understanding the issues, we can start planning. Okay, thank you. We can uh, understand them, uh, plan around them, address them, and actually solving them. So uh, now before, uh, uh, we, we, I go on. I want to recall very quickly this concept of smart cities. Whenever we talk about smart cities, we are talking about cities with brain. Unfortunately, right now, we have shifted uh, uh, the, the focus from data per se to kind of like what we can actually do with data. And while in developed countries, uh, it has been this logical evolution to open source the data, for emerging economies, we are still, and I'm saying we because I'm from Mexico, thank you, uh, we are still struggling with sourcing it and, and, and digitalizing it. Uh, the, the way we can tackle this is through civic innovation, technology, and above all, through community. And all that, we can do it. So let me just tell you very quickly about our latest project in Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam is a city that has um, exponentially growth, uh, who, which, uh, who, which has doubled its uh, population in the last two years. Yeah, it's a little bit small. Uh, in the last two years, and of course, it has outpaced its uh, capacity to provide basic infrastructure and services. So uh, I always say that everything starts with a map because a map helps us out to make sense of the challenges we are facing. In 2010, the, uh, the government started developing this digital map, but it wasn't until 2015 that a series of stakeholders, including Ramani Huria, the World Bank, the University of Dar es Salaam, Ali, the humanitarian open street map, and many others, that we actually developed the first digital map upon which we are going to start developing solutions. The next step was to track the, what, what was, was to tackle mobility. So we started tracking the, 
almost 300 roots of the Daladalas. For all of you who are not acquainted with this, is this artisanal form of transportation, in, particularly in Latin America and Southeast Asia, is very is the, these very like small vans that can get anywhere, uh, producing what we call the penny war, which. <laughs> I cannot explain right now, but uh, in, uh, at least in Latin America, we have called them the necessary evil. So um, uh, by doing this, uh, we open source the data in OpenStreetMap. That makes the data available for anybody with or without tech knowledge to understand it and to actually stop being just receptors but actually becoming solutions providers. So um, the, the first uh, immediate solution that we have created is this Ali app. Ali app is uh, the, our intermodal app that includes the Daladalas. In the case of Dar es Salaam, it includes the Daladalas, the train, the ferry, and the future BRT that hopefully it will open in 2016. Um, but with data, we are able to, um, to provide multimodal uh, routing with formal transport, artisanal transport, and alternative transport. This, this, this is the way we are actually shifting the paradigm, you know, from this kind of like, I want to have my car, to actually give them options to start using the public transportation more efficiently. So we have also developer features the safety or fall and follow me feature, which is kind of like uh, sharing your virtual ride with, some, with someone home. Um, probably in Europe, uh, for you, is, this is not very common. But for example, in Mexico, when you go out from work at 11 PM, trust me, my dad would have killed for this kind of app to let him know that I, that I was about to get home. And, so, and then uh, through the use of this app, we are actually uh, gather and produce data that will allow us to understand the commuters, to understand the pattern, their patterns, their behaviors, and sometimes even their experiences. Uh, all this is valuable knowledge uh, to, for, you know, for uh, on not, not only understanding what we're facing, but also for urban planning, for policy making. And for everybody here, you name it. So this is how uh, we actually we, 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 we can actually uh, the, we can actually focus in what can we do with data. We, this is how we change the paradigms, and this is how we plan to turn the tables. Thank you. Okay. Next one is uh, Christian Christian Oldendorf. He's the sorry. Albert is on? Okay, no, no problem. <laughs> one or the other. Um, Albert is on. He's the CEO of Bismart. Who it's a company. Uh, According to uh, Albert, is the preferred big data partner of Barcelona, providing innovative solutions for smart cities. Thank you. Welcome to Barcelona. My name is Albert Isern. I am the co-founder of um, Be Smart, and I would like to share with you that we are extremely excited because Be Smart is the worldwide partner of the year of Microsoft in business intelligence. Okay, what is the reason? Bismarck is a big data specialist company for smart cities. We provide the best solutions to help cities to power, to improve the quality of life in the city, and to promote the economy development. Data is essential for, um, for improve, improve cities. Data, data is essential to help uh, make uh, to help decision making and we transform this data into intelligent action okay please fasten your seat belts we are taking off here we have a real-time dashboard that we are gathering real-time information from city sensors through software 
thanks to the to the Azure, to the, through, thanks to the Microsoft Cloud, we are gathering this real-time information. Um, in and in, 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 in this software layer, we are correlating this information with the millions and millions of events that a city is producing. We are gathering this information from sensors, from social analytics, from weather information status, from traffic information status, from public transport information, from whatever source of any city have that are producing data. And we can see this um, LIGO um, 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 train driver that is uh, driving our high-speed train. And we can gather all this information in real time. Thanks to this software, we can process this information, this complex events process in the city. And we can apply intelligence and we can make actions with this interesting information. Okay. Uh, clap your hands for this uh, legal train driver, please. <laughs> Next one. This is a bus service managing dashboard. Uh, gathering all this real-time information, gathering this, also the historic information, we are correlating this information and we provide data to help decision making and to make actions. Here we can see this dashboard and we can see the state of every bus in our fleet. We can see the state of every sensor and every component of our fleet. We are seeing the interior temperature, we can see the autonomy, we can see the emission, we can see the wheels, the pressure of the wheels, and we can see in this bus, in this 301 bus, has a problem, in a critical error problem in the front doors. Then we can make an action. After this information, we can apply action, intelligent action. In this case, we can ask for replacing the bus. As we can see, our red bus has the, this problem and, and it, this bus, it is gonna home <laughs> to make replace. Please, another time, clap your hands for this red bus that is going to the terminal, woo! <laughs> Next one. We can analyze more information. Thanks to all this data that the cities are generating, we can make the best decisions. Social analytics, another time in public transport application. People is enjoying the best festival in La Merced, the Barcelona Annual Festival. Shakira is, is up, is on, on fire, and people, is on fi people are on fire are enjoying and we are listening this social media. We analyze all this information, we put this information in our sentiment analytics engine and people is happy and then the city council became happy. Okay, let's go. People are exhausted, are tired, they wanna get home as soon as possible. And when they arrive at the bus stop, no more buses are there. Then people start to complain, but we are listening this social media, we are listening to this new channel, and we can react. We discover this problem and we can react. And then the city council is asking to the terminal buses to send more buses to the bus stop. And then when buses arrive at the bus stop, people became happy, and then another time we became happy. Woo, clap your hands for this social analytics engine. Now I would like to show you this engine this is, this is not the Star Wars 7 edition, okay? This is our social analytics engine. We can gather this contents of the tweets, we can gather the information, words, we can correlate these words to understand context. If tweets are talking about culture, are talking about politician, are talking about economy, are talking about a new theme, we can realize if they are talking about a demonstration in the city, in the center, then we have to provide buses for the demonstration or not, or emergency systems and services to help any, any problem in the city. It is our social analytic tools that have um, functionalities for any need in the city. I would like to show you, yes, I have more time. I would like to show you another of our real-time dashboards. In this case, we are analyzing the flow we are analyzing the flow, where people are jumping in the bus, in which bus stop, and where people are leaving the, the stop. With this amazing dashboard, we are understanding this information. And not only that, we are analyzing or we are discovering fraud 
in our bus transport. In Spain, we don't have fraud. We don't have, there are not corruption. It's another country, okay? And we, how we discover this, this fraud? Because we are comparing the validation ticket machine, the ticket machines, with the people that are in the bus. How can we do that? The buses and the doors, they have a sensor, a counting people sensor, and we have other sensors, like the Wi-Fi. Barcelona Public Transport are deploying Wi-Fi network inside the buses, and thanks to the mobile phones, we can analyze how many people are in the buses. And not only we are <laughs> sending inspectors to this critical bus, okay? Uh, now don't clap your hands for these inspectors, please. And, and another time, we have, I would like to present you the, um, this, these demos, not running right well, trying against. Okay, every color is a mobile phone. We are gathering information from this, uh, yes. Uh, this yellow phone is going to the, to ski to the Pyrenees. This bl uh, blue phone is going to Madrid. We are gathering the movement of the people in an anonymous way directly from the smartphone. Why? How come we do that? We are deploying a smart solution. People are download, downloading a smart solution and we can gather the real roads in the city. We are providing the best smart city road for the visitors, gathering real life, life information of the city, gathering information of scheduled events, ticket prices, public information status, transport information status. We can provide this, the best smart city route for the visitors. Then visitors can live the best experience in the city. The city council can shape the tourist model. They can offer points of interest aligned with the director plan, the business plan of the city as, uh, as a smart destination. And also the city council can gather real feedback where people are going. If people are going to the Salada Familia or the visitors spend the time in the Plaza Real, Real Square, drinking beers or, or uh, having a paella, okay? They can gather the real feedback of the citizens, their real movements in an anonymous way, don't worry, and People, visitors can rate, they can rate the points of interest that we suggest. It's an intelligent route. Why is intelligent? Because we, it's made by in, um, live information. It's not a static, uh, it's not an static tourist um, road. It's with a live information. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much for your attendance and see you at our booth at the Microsoft booth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Albert. Very impressive. Um, now, last but not least, is the last of our speakers. It's uh, Christian Oldendorf. This time it's you, Christian. Uh, he's the uh, founder and CEO of ParkU, a German company, again, uh, on parking, again. <laughs> and uh, He will uh, explain us how ParkU is uh, allowing a more efficient use of parking spaces by bringing together uh, owners and seekers in a digital marketplace. Uh, please, uh, Christian. Thank you very much. One of the many benefits of going last is that many things that have to be explained don't have to be explained a second or a third time. I thank my colleagues very much for, for making an introduction. We all can take away that the social implications of parking are quite rapid. There are economic implications, there are commercial implications, there are also social implications. The, the ParkU app is a live app, which has been uh, in, the, in the market for three years. There's an iOS and an Android app. We offer people to share their parking spaces. Now, how does that work? Our parking spaces that we offer are privately owned. They're not public. Uh, you can describe them as uh, can differentiate on-street and off-street parking. Off-street parking, in our mind, is a parking space that is owned by someone or by a company that, in this case, might not need it at a certain point of time. 
Um, as you mentioned, parking spaces, is, uh, every car doesn't need one parking space, but two and a half. The other one and a half that the car isn't using right now can be entered into our system and rented out to others. In dense cities such as, such as Zurich or, or Berlin, Hamburg, Vienna, Amsterdam, people are circulating for parking because they don't know where to go. That's the, the takeaway from an earlier speech. We would like to help with exactly that problem. So what do we do? We are in market space for parking spaces. We would like to create transparency for the driver in order to know where he will go. What it does, it's quite simple. He can find in three steps. He can define, first of all, where he wants to go. Second of all, he can describe, describe the, uh, the, the circumstances he wants to park in, covered, uncovered, um, at which price. Uh, he's got a wide selection in, in most cities. He can book with one click and can even find, find access with another click. We offer on-street parking spaces, uh, well, parking spaces that are available from the street um, without a barrier or a gate in Zurich and in other Swiss cities because the structure there is possible. In cities within, within Germany, in cities within, uh, within, uh, within Holland and Austria, most good parking spaces that are inside the city are mostly behind barriers and gates for obvious reasons, for, to avoid abuse. We develop an element of hardware which we supply for free to our customers, install this in the gate or the barrier, and make the parking space available to the customer who books because he can then control the gate or the barrier through the app. It's quite nifty. It doesn't uh, take much to install. It's quite cheap too. Um, the, uh, the rest of the system, the payment, uh, the navigation is also included. It's uh, for us a, a holistic approach towards parking and it's also a very good way of allowing people to stop to circulate because if you know exactly that you have to be, that you can, that you can access the gate at 1500 at this and this location which is around the corner from where you work, from where you live, that's, that's for us the essence of how it can reduce search traffic right now for everybody throughout the app. Of course, we do follow our users around quite a bit. Once they, once they look for parking spaces, they have several characters. Some want to book now, because they have the stress right now. Some of them have an appointment, which they would like to take, uh, which they'd like to take an account for at a certain, given amount of, a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of time, uh, at a certain location. So you can actually book this in advance. Some others, um, I don't know how many people have you been to Amsterdam by car. It's a nightmare to drive around. You won't, you won't be, end up anywhere and you'll waste a lot of time, a lot of money as well if you get fined. Um, some people like to look, book long term and go to a city by, from, from the countryside or from wherever they came from, leave the car in a certain location, uh, drop it there, not have to worry about it for a week and just go on by public transportation because it's getting better and better and better. The different characters of how people book, we, we try to use it as best as, as possible in order to optimize our product. The, uh, the ways that we've found uh, quite sensible is that through following our, our users uh, quite extensively, we of course know where to look for parking spaces. Our sales team approach uh, real estate operators, they approach airports, they approach uh, um, people in the public domain to, to try and find pu parking spaces to add to the system. Um, we know that within larger cities, and the perception in the 70s and 80s when many buildings were built that people like to use their cars. In many cities such as our hometown of Berlin, it's not true anymore. If you look at a, a large construction within, a, within an office space or within a, even a residential building, there's always one, two, three, four, let's say the last 10% of the parking spaces are always free because the people's mindset have changed. Driving is expensive, it takes time, parking is an issue. There are many reasons why people don't want to have cars. The good thing is, for our system, there's always one or two locations which you can offer to the rest of the system. And you can actually monetize this dead resource, in which, you can, which, is, which is not a, a 100 euro resource. We have one customer who within Zurich earns 4,500 francs a month with five parking spaces. OK, they're next to the stadium, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're right where people want to go and want to, want to stay. But the, um, what he wants to convey is that there's real money in this, and park here is the access point to it. Um, we, we try to, of course, use this argument when we go to, um, go on to, to, to going towards uh, uh, airports or even larger professional operators of parking, parking lots such as of Coa, Q Park and Conti Park. By being able to access the customer directly through the application, you can do, first of all, a very sophisticated method of price differentiation, which you can maximize your utility, which, uh, which uh, would lead to, uh, to higher overall profit. And you can even segment that down to your most loyal customers, to customers who are, who are related to the next door shopping center or to the sports event or maybe public transportation in other ways. 
Speaking about public, public transportation, in a city that want to become car free and want to want to further bus transportation, uh, the, the use of e-bikes, uh, so on and so forth. But we see that cities such as Munich, who have a very strong ambition in doing this, they create a frame in which they don't want cars to go anymore. But what happens at these frames, people might come by car and want to change to intermodal transport, right? They want to go and use the e-bikes, want to use the, the rails, they want to use the, the trams, but they will still need to have, to have a place to leave their car at all. Otherwise, they'll just get frustrated in, in the first place and not, and not adapt the system. People have to be encouraged to have a positive view of how the city wants them to behave. Catering to their needs is one of the elements that you have to do as a city in order to provide for this. And parking will remain an element. I can promise to you this. As it'll take, it'll, it, I'm sure that at some point there'll be uh, less cars in, in the cities, but it'll take a time. And uh, ParkU is a good solution of, of giving people what they need in a, in a very concise, complete product. Got seven seconds left. I want to use them to thank you very much and wish you a happy time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christian. Uh, now the, 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 the speeches are over and, and we have still a couple of minutes, five minutes for questions. So if, you, if, the, if the audience has any question, please, please do. I have a question for Sylvan, in fact, so I, I will use I will use the, this time for for Sylvan. Um, it, as I understood from from your from your service, um, the more people using it, uh, the better uh, service. So critical mass could be uh, important for for the success of your application. Um, do you have uh, any incentives for users to to use the app? Uh, have you set up this? Yeah, absolutely. So, so actually, we obviously have an incentive, which is finding a parking spot through the app. So that is one of the incentives. Speaking about the critical mass a little bit, though, um, you need a minimum of two percent of all drivers of a city to use this uh, to use this system for it to work. So a good ballpark figure is six percent of all drivers of a city. Then it becomes really, really good service. Obviously, there is a lot of ideas, and also some of our customers that have incentivization models to incentivize the actual usage of the app because. You you would want to have a fair usage policy. People that have the app are contributing, but they're also consuming parking spots. So you need to balance that a little bit. So the incentivization sits with our customers that use our technology. One more question here. Does it work? That's right. Um, you were talking, many of you, you were talking about parking, and parking is an issue in most European cities and American cities too. Um, what I wonder is, uh, is anybody uh, doing something about adaptive parking pricing, like for example, pricing on demand, and something like, uh, and especially for the city governments, for you know, trying to optimize the parking because if parking gets to a point that is quite a little bit more expensive depending on demand, there will be always parking spaces available. And we know that about, some figures say that about 30% of the time that people are driving in a the city, they're looking for parking. I don't know anybody. <laughs> it's an open question, uh, probably, I don't know. I mean, of course, we, we encourage dynamic pricing uh, based on, uh, on demand. Um, it's a great way to steer the traffic. What you need, of course, is you need to know where are the parking spaces busy and where they are not busy. So you can uh, increase the price where they're very busy. Uh, the city of San Francisco were the first ones to do dynamic pricing. They tried. Uh, unfortunately, the technology there didn't, didn't work so well. Uh, and the batteries of the ground sensors were, uh, were gone after three years, so they closed down the system. But the idea was very good to do dynamic pricing, and we can only encourage that. Okay. I would just uh, add one thing. Uh, if you do dynamic pricing, please think of the end user who needs to know a little bit what he can expect in terms of, tra of pricing, because uh, if dynamic becomes uh, hectic, then uh, end users uh, get uh, unsatisfied, I, I would say. Um, well, I think that 
we have run out of time, so I would like to thank all the speakers for, for their time, for the, for the interesting uh, things they have told us today, and thank you all the audience for, for your attendance.